Welcome everyone to the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of brief announcements. First, um, next Wednesday's meeting is um, canceled. We will not have a Green Mountain Care Board meeting on the 3rd. Um, we have posted our meeting schedule for October. I've reviewed it in the past. We, we have a busy month ahead. Uh, we'll be having an advisory committee meeting here on the 10th, and then we'll, in addition to our regular board meetings, we'll be going down to the Upper Valley for a traveling board meeting at the end of the month. And I would ask folks um, to please sign in out at the front desk if you haven't already. And that's all I have to report. Christina, do we have any board members on the phone? I am. This is Robin. I am on the phone. Thank you, Robin. I just wanted to uh, make sure before we made any motions, because it'll have to be by roll. So the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, September 19th. Is there a motion? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 19th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Judy, will you call the roll? Sure. Um, Member Holm? Yes. Pelham? Yes. Lunge? Yes. Chair? Yes. Passes. Okay. Approved. So the next item on the agenda is the health resource allocation plan. And Marissa, if you could join us. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Marissa Melamed, Health Policy Advisor with the Green Mountain Care Board. And I'm going to give you an update this afternoon on the board's work on updating the health resource allocation plan, which is commonly and lovingly referred to as the HRAP. Just a quick agenda run through. I'll give you a review of the new statute that passed this spring. Go over a high-level timeline for when we, how we expect the project to progress. And then uh, items three, um, four, and five are a little bit of a look at some of the work that we've done so far. Uh, and we'll finish up reviewing the stakeholder uh, and public input process. So just for some quick history, um, in 2003, the legislation was passed that created the Health Resource Allocation Plan. The plan was first published in 2005 and was updated in 2009. Uh, last year, the Green Mountain Care Board convened a stakeholder group to reimagine the HRAP and develop a proposal to update the underlying statute to better align with the vision that came out of that group. And just as a reminder, Kate O'Neill and I at the board presented those recommendations to the board back in November, and the bill worked its way through the legislative process and passed in May. The and old we have HRAP. One of the key members of the legislature here that's been involved with the HRAP legislation, Representative Donahue, so just want to welcome her as well. Wonderful. So part of the underlying reason for doing this update uh, is that the old HRAP described a static inventory of a specified set of healthcare resources with a focus on supply. Um, we heard that it was not a driver of solutions, um, was not being used as well as it could be, um, and it did not measure gaps or the under, underlying need. So we worked on a vision for a new HRAP to replace the static inventory and the uh, narrative report, which people are familiar with that looks like this, uh, that was published in 2009. Um, we envision that the new HRAP will utilize existing data sources, be, dynamic, be more dynamic and up to date, uh, and that it will not look like a, a static published report um, like this, but, but be some, something that's um, published online, more interactive and easier to use. The new HRAP lang language is found in Act 167 of 2018, uh, an act relating to the healthcare regulatory duties of the Green Mountain Care Board. 
And the new language, just to summarize, is more general resource allocation language that allows more flexibility uh, to create a, a tool that improves its relevancy and to help Green Mountain Care Board members with analysis and decision making around CON, hospital budgets, ACO budgets and certification, um, as well as to be a resource for other state and community decision makers on health policy and planning. And on the slide, I have printed here the language, excuse me, from the um, statute that the Green Mountain Care Board shall publish on its website the ATRAP, which will identify Vermont's critical health needs, goods, services, and resources. Uh, the plan shall identify Vermont residents' needs for healthcare services, programs, and facilities, the resources available, and the additional resources that would be required to realistically meet those needs and to make access to those services, programs, and facilities affordable for consumers and the priorities for addressing those needs on a statewide basis. The board may also expand the plan to include the resources, needs, and priorities related to the social determinants of health and the plan should be revised periodically, but not less frequently than once every four years. The new ATRAP is required to do the following things. Again, this is straight from the legislation. To identify Vermont's critical health needs, goods, services, and resources. To consider the principles in 18 VSA 9371, the principles for health care reform and to identify priorities using existing uh, data sources and reports, such as the health, state health improvement plan, community health needs assessments, healthcare workforce information that is available, as well as materials provided to the board through its regulatory processes, as well as a public input process. We're also required to identify utilization trends to determine areas of underutilization and overutilization, and to consider the cost impacts of fulfilling any gaps between the supply of health resources and the health needs of Vermont residents. Then the statute defines health resources as investments in the state's healthcare system, including investments in personnel, equipment, and, and infrastructure necessary to deliver hospital, nursing home, and other inpatient services, ambulatory care, including primary care services, mental health services, health screening and early intervention services, and services for the prevention and treatment of substance use disorders. Also home health services and emergency care, including ambulance services, um, and again, we may expand the definition of resources to include investments in personnel, equipment, and infrastructure necessary to address the social determinants of health. So for a timeline, work kicked off on the project uh, just recently between August and September. So we are still in an early initiation and planning phases, um, which includes forming an internal Green Mountain Care Board project team, developing the project plan, and planning for interagency and stakeholder engagement. An immediate need that we have is to fill an open data analyst position on our uh, data analytics team. This position is a director of data management and uh, sorry, director of data management analysis and integrity. Uh, and the position will allow us to manage, analyze, and visualize the data in-house. Um, and I'll put a plug in here that that position does close tomorrow on the VTHR website. So if you know of any data analysts, data geeks out there that want to join this uh, exciting, uh, innovative project, they should apply immediately this afternoon. We, uh, in looking at the requirements, uh, we've anticipated that the project will take approximately 18 months uh, with a goal of releasing the final project in January, or the final product in January of 2020. So I've been calling it HRAP 2020. And I have up here just the high level timeline um, showing uh, right now, we're in this initiation and planning phase, we're doing background research, landscape review, looking at available resource and needs data, uh, what data do we need, where is the data. Uh, we'll move into a data collection uh, in the winter where we would like to begin collecting data from agencies, hospitals, health facilities, um, and looking at how to create templates or prototypes for what it might look like when we present the data and analysis. 
in the spring of 2019, we'll continue with uh, data collection and analysis, including a gap analysis and uh, prototypes for what the product might look like. Uh, continuing that into the summer and fall of 2019, the gap analysis and cost estimates. Then finally with the January 2020 release goal where the, the final product would be posted to our website. So just to give you a little glimpse of what we've done so far. Uh, we did a visioning the future exercise last year with stakeholders in 2017 in preparing for the legislative proposal. Uh, again, this is all still in that planning phase, so these are open to change and revision, uh, but we've been working toward a project charter to work off of. And the current working vision is that ATRAP 2020 uh, will deliver an up-to-date, sustainable, and dynamic resource that enables more informed health resource allocation decision-making across the state using state and national data. The HRAP will identify gaps in excess in healthcare services, availability and accessibility, and consider the underlying health needs across communities in Vermont. With this, there are four objectives that we have been developing. The first is to create a resource to provide easily accessible data on health resources and needs and align data across healthcare sectors or health sectors that the planning process is guided by Vermont's long-term strategic direction for health and health care, and that population health needs guide resource allocation planning, as well as community involvement in decision-making is data-informed and a necessary element in determining community needs. The deliverables are an inventory of health resources across sectors, a profile of health needs and priorities across communities, a gap analysis between resources and those needs and priorities, a report on utilization trends, including over and under utilization, and cost estimates of fulfilling the gaps. Again, this is a pre sort of preliminary look of what we've been working on. Um, in terms of the first two bullets on the slides before of the inventory of health resources and the profile of health needs and priorities. Our initial planning has generated this list of 12 uh, sectors to include in the resource inventory. The sectors are either required in the new HRAP statute or were included based on identified state health priorities. Again, this is a draft. It will go through review, but we've included it today to illustrate some of our initial work. Under each sector, we will then identify the detailed data we intend to collect on, collect on facilities, services, programs, and equipment to give us a picture of what resources we have and where they're located. This list includes both services and settings uh, and represents only initial work we've done in preparation for data collection. And as well as I'd want to point out that the inventory information that we collect is an area that we would likely be looking to collect new data in addition to existing data that's out there. And that could come in the form of uh, surveys to uh, healthcare facilities, organizations, providers. The next side of that is the profile of health needs and priorities. Again, these will be identified through and informed by existing data sources and health needs assessments that the state is currently working on or is continuously working on, including community profiles. So far, we've identified the roughly 18 categories of health indicators listed here as those to include in the ATRAP. And again, this is a draft, and we'll revise categories as needed as we collect input, but these should look fairly familiar. This is not exhaustive, but just to include this visual of the many health-related data sources that currently exist. Um, part of what we have are doing is um, looking at these data sources as well as various uh, data inventories that have been done by the Department of Health and the SIM project um, that help us better understand the data that's out there to help us answer the questions that we have 
about the needs and resources for Vermonters. And I touched on this a little bit already, but the purpose of the HRAP is to inform the board's regulatory processes, cost containment and statewide quality of care efforts, healthcare payment and delivery system reform initiatives, and any allocation of health resources within the state. And so in addition to the board's regulatory processes, uh, we hope that this would be a larger plan that can be used more statewide for community health planning um, and pu public health policy. And finally, there'll be a stakeholder and public input process. As with anything that we do, we intend to coordinate the public process um, and conduct it through the Green Mountain Care Board public meeting. So today would be the, our first update. We anticipate that we would do this various stages along the way to update the public, um, as well as utilize our board advisory committee and the primary care advisory group, which are ex existing means of collecting input. And we're currently developing a more detailed stakeholder engagement plan to include other state agencies and departments, external organizations. Um, we have a project that's beginning to collect qualitative data from providers, um, as well as ongoing public input through general board meetings or posted materials. And that concludes my prepared comments. I'm happy to answer any questions or take comment and people are welcome to reach out to me directly. So before I open it up to the board, I just wanted to know if uh, Jess had anything further to add. She's been kind of the uh, person that's had the um, vision to see what the HRAP could be rather than what it has been. And so I'd like to give you the opportunity to uh, add anything. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I, I guess I would just say that I'm extremely optimistic that this is going to be a new document that will be helpful in our decision making. My hope is that it's helpful also for other state organizations and agencies in, in their resource allocation. I think that um, a lot of the needs data is already out there. This is, a, this is a project that's going to basically compile all of that data in one place, but marry it to uh, inventory data that we, we haven't done in a while. So really looking at both of them side by side, both the demand side and the supply side, and identifying gaps. And I'm extremely optimistic, and I'm thankful for the team that we have on staff that's going to do this. And I think it's a, a big project, but if we do it well, it's going to be an incredible resource that I think potentially could be emulated by other states. So. Thank you. Okay, are there questions for Marissa from the board? Tom. So thank you very much. This is a daunting task. I look at that list of data sources and think about how does one, two, or three people, not to say ten people, get to know all those and integrate them. And uh, so thank you for this and thank you, Jess, for leading the charge here. The only comment that I would have is that on the page, um, HRAP 2020 vision. Um, it says HRAP identifies gaps in excess in healthcare services. And elsewhere in this document where um, you talk about gaps, it's just gaps and not excesses. And um, I guess as a, a thematic kind of thing, I, I think in kind of looking at the system in its entirety, uh, there are always gaps and there are always excesses. And possibly in the summer, fall, when you get to 2019, um, it's not only developing cost estimates for the gaps, but, it, but maybe um, the reallocation of resources within in the overall system to fill some of those gaps. So that's the, that's the only uh, uh, emphasis I would have. This is, this is a great job and um, a really tough task ahead. Interesting task, but a tough task ahead, and I wish you the best. <laughs> yeah, and that I will just say the uh, qualitative data that we're beginning to collect from providers, I think, is with the intention of to get at some of that utilization over and under, because that's a tough um, nut to crack and understand. So we're looking to speak directly with providers about um, how they view that in their practices and settings. OK, if there's no one else from the board, we'll open it up to the uh, public for comment on the HRAP.
Representative Donahue. Uh, as somebody who was involved in the vision in 2003, I'm uh, thrilled to see the 2020 vision as being uh, totally aligned with the original vision and hopefully going to create um, what was originally intended rather than some of the um, other directions that it ended up. I think it's a, a, a really vital um, and, and I heard uh, in another setting somewhere that I would be distressed by the timeline. I'm actually thrilled by the timeline. I think doing it right is what will make it um, valuable, and um, it does take time to do something right. So I really praise the work that's been done. Let's so all fess up and admit that it was me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other. Yes, go ahead. Julie. Julie Tessler for one of the partners. Um, thanks so much. I really appreciate the comprehensiveness of this, and I have a representative value to thank also for making sure that mental health is highlighted. In looking at the profile of health needs and priorities, I mean, there's a category that says demographic, socioeconomic, and environmental factors. I'm wondering if racial and cultural diversity factors are also included in that. I just wasn't sure. We're not at that level of detail. I think we're going to use uh, partner with the Department of Health and and look at it the way that they are looking at it in some of their current plans, the state health assessment and state health improvement plan. Um, and that's a conversation that we're just beginning to have. So um, my intention would be to align it with how uh, other agencies are, are using those indicators. That's I'll just add to that and say that where we're pulling from that is the understanding that there's you know, definitely inequities across different socioeconomic variables. And so to the extent that through census data, we can get, for example, racial differences and access and things like that, we are going to do that. So. In my understanding that those disparities are highlights of the, I see the Department of Health here, highlights of the chip in the Shah this year. So. <laughs> Okay, Dale. Would that involve a context of epigenetics? So I had a tough time hearing you, Dale. Can you repeat that? Um, would that involve a uh, context of epigenetics as well? Was that I can put it, I can add it to the list of things to look at, but it had not come up in our initial conversations. Thank Heidi. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Heidi Klein from the State Health Department, and I just want to say I, I really love the way this vision is going. Um, as you probably know, that the, the current thing happened in the State Health Improvement Plan, uh, the focus currently is on chronic disease prevention, mental health, substance use, and uh, immunization. The next state health improvement plan will be focused on oral health, substance use, mental health, early childhood, and chronic disease. There we go. Yep, those are the five. So I just think that as this uh, unfolds, there's a really nice synergy in, in what you're excuse me, in what you're looking at and the ways in which we have been collecting and analyzing the data over time. So I think there's going to be a nice collaboration where we can offer you the data that we have, um, a lot of which we will not have down to the level um, of being able to say by community where we can see inequities, but we can see across the state our, our, our data size is just too small to be able to look at sort of sub-state uh, work on ethnicity, uh, disability, uh, gender, um, identity, and poverty we will be able to substitute. So just so you get a sense of what we'll have to offer. And then, Bruce, I just have one question for you, and that was, in one of the data places it seemed to include mental health, and in another place it didn't. And so I'm just wondering what you think. The extent to which um, mental health and uh, substance use will be included. I was delighted to see oral health is, because oftentimes oral health is not considered part of um, health, but we see it as part of the whole body as part of health and not a separate uh, piece in, as it would be reflected in our state health improvement plan. Our preliminary work has identified both mental health and dental health and oral health. If you mean the, um, 
these, there's these. Men mental yes, health and dental care on this <laughs> and both. It does. Up at the top, um, top right, that is. That's. And actually, can I just jump in here for a quick second? Because we um, are thinking about the state health assessment plan and had wonderful conversations with you already and the, the presentation that you made, one of the things that we've been thinking about is since the spring is going to be a prototyping phase, we were going to take the categories that have been identified by the Department of Health as those key areas where we need to focus and, and prototype those. So in some sense, we're trying to align right away. Yeah. And I'd add two on your comment about the community level. Um, you are addressing the state health improvement plan and the assessment plan. We are also, um, another required assessment that we need to look at are the community health assessments put up at the hospital, um, which there's also some VDH Green Mountain Care Board um, coordination work going on there. And um, at least initially to me, I identify those as a community level way of um, looking at needs and in ways that we can use that process um, to get at community level look at disparities, for example, or other um, community specific needs. Uh, we're hoping to use that um, process. The other questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, it's a great start. And, uh, as Tom said, it's a daunting task that you have ahead of you, Marissa with many others who are going to assist. <laughs> Especially the person that we hire by tomorrow, right? Or <laughs> Thank you. So at this point, we'll invite Agatha to come forward. So we're switching gears and getting an update and an overview on the working group that was established in legislation on the individual mandate. And uh, when Agatha gets forward, uh, she can introduce um, our special guest and thank him for traveling to Vermont today. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to quickly figure out how the pointer works. Okay. So, hello. Um, we are here this afternoon to give the board an update on Act 182, the Individual Mandate Working Group's report, and provide an overview of their preliminary recommendations. And before I get started, was there anything, Kevin, that you wanted to open up with, or I can go ahead and jump in? So, I think you can go ahead and jump okay. in. Yeah. Okay. Unless I, I, I heard some stirring in the background. Robin, did you want to say anything? We can. Um, but I think, okay, great. I think if people know that um, Green Mountain Care Board was a required participant in the individual mandate working group, which is a working group set up by legislation uh, to look at the details and uh, potential administration of an individual mandate. Um, and the mandate itself is passed by the legislature. So, uh, this, the work has been diligently meeting and, and trying to work through, quite frankly, a lot of very detailed information over the course of the summer. And um, it seemed like it was an appropriate time to bring the rest of the board up to speed on that work. So that's why we are hearing from Melissa today. So uh, with that, I'll just sort of back. Uh, Merci beaucoup, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Um, with me today is Jason Levitis. Jason is a health policy expert on the ACA and has been working with the group during the duration of its discussions. Jason led implementation of the individual mandate and other ACA tax provisions at the Treasury Department. So thank you, Jason, for joining us today. He came up from Washington, D.C. today. 
Um, several of the working group's recommendation, recommendations are adjustments or modifications to federal policy. And so Jason is here to provide a background on that federal policy, which will give more context to the working group's preliminary recommendations. Uh, on the screen here, you will see our agenda for this afternoon, which should take no more than an hour. Um, we'll briefly go over Act 182 of 2018, the act that established the, the individual mandate and the working group. And we will go over the individual mandate, what it is, what we know about Vermont, including information um, about the federal individual, individual mandate penalty in Vermont, information about the uninsured population in Vermont, and information about the impact of removing the federal penalty in Vermont. Um, after that, Jason will provide an overview of the federal individual mandate, after which we will review the working group's preliminary recommendations, which they plan to include in the report that they submit to the General Assembly on November 1st. Um, I'd like to mention that there are some members of the working group in the audience here today. Um, and Robin, as you know, is on the line and has offered to chime in if, there, if questions come up that are best suited for a member of the working group, because as you know, I was not a member of the working group. So please stop us along the way if you have any questions, and with that, we'll get started. Okay, so these next couple slides are just gonna be some background on Act 182 in the working group. <clears throat> the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 eliminated the federal, federal penalty associated with the individual mandate. In response to this, the Vermont General Assembly enacted Act 182 of 2018. This act established an individual mandate in Vermont. It also established the intent, intent that the 2019 General Assembly should enact a financial penalty or other enforcement mechanism. And the act established the individual mandate working group um, to come up with recommendations on minimum essential coverage, exemptions, enforcement, and administration. And those are the recommendations, preliminary recommendations you'll be hearing today. Um, <clears throat> Act 182 requires the working group to submit a report to the General Assembly by November 1st. I love this pointer. Um, and in order to meet that deadline, the working group began their work at the beginning of the summer. And they plan to release their draft re report for public comment by this Friday. The board is hearing the working group's initial recommendations today, and there is time on your October 17th board meeting to return to this topic after the public comment period. These next couple slides deal with the working group itself specifically, and I don't plan to read them um, to you, except to highlight that the members of the working group as required by Act 182 are listed there by department, and as you know, Robin is the Green Mountain Care Board appointee. Um, and also just to highlight the public comment process. The draft report is scheduled to be released on Friday and people can submit comments to the um, email address that's right up there on the bottom of the slide and also those phone numbers. And as always, if anybody wants to send a public comment directly to the board, they can do so by using the board's standard public um, comment process and those instructions are posted on the Green Mountain Care Board website. Uh, next slide. Again, I'm not going to read this except to point out this section on principles and process. Um, in prioritizing the working group's charge as set forth in Act 182, the group informally adopted principles to guide their work and maintain focus. In doing so, the group agreed that the recommendations should focus on maintaining Vermont's low uninsurance rate. The recommendations should strive to be practical. Uh, in other words, the recommendations should balance the complexity of healthcare policy and administrative burden with Vermonters' best interests, which is not always, never an easy thing to do. And lastly, the recommendations should include alternative options to present different perspectives and priorities. Okay, that brings us to the data slides. Are there any questions so far? So these next slides are going to um, demonstrate the scope of the, the federal individual mandate here in Vermont. And we're working with 2016 IRS data, which is the most current data available. Um, so this chart shows in the upper portions in white, income ranges broken down by um, 
FPL level. These are the different FPL levels here. And, um, and these are the, the buckets on the IRS data chart. The, the cells that are highlighted in orange here and here are the FPL levels that are eligible for Medicaid, Vermont premium assistance, or federal premium tax credits to kind of give you a sense of who's paying the penalty and what are their income ranges. Um, the lower portion of the data in green, I'm sorry, in blue here, shows the number of returns, federal returns in Vermont. So there are 325,860 um, federal returns in Vermont, and of those, the green portion below, 10,590 of them were subject to the individual mandate penalty, about 3.2% um, of the returns. Now, there's an important thing to note here, and it's in the footnote, um, is that this chart overstates the amount of the penalty that was actually paid. Uh, in this chart, which comes directly from the IRS, it appears as though the income ranges that qualify for Medicaid were assessed at the penalty when, in fact, they were not, and if they were, it was a mistake. So if they, they did qualify for the Medicaid, the low-income um, exemption, and they paid, they were refunded that, that amount. So this $7.3 million that it looks as though were, was collected in Vermont is actually an overstatement. And Jason, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, that's exactly right. There was some uh, confusion on the tax forms, um, which led people to make erroneous payments, and the IRS has taken action both with respect to those who overpaid at the time and also to prevent those errors going forward. This next slide looks deceptively the same, but it's different. It's a comparison of 2015 to 2016. So as you can see, and it's only showing the change. So as you can see, there were in uh, 2016, as compared to 2015, 2,290 fewer returns that were subject to the individual mandate, um, but that the uh, amount of the penalty that, that was collected increased increased by 1.2 million. Um, during the same time period, the same two-year time period, the penalty increased from $325 per adult to $695 per, per adult. So any questions on these IRS charts before we move on? This kind of is uh, presenting the scope of the, the individual mandate in Vermont with the most recent data that we have. So this next chart, um, this next slide has to do with the uninsured population here in Vermont. <clears throat> These two tables represent two different uninsured populations. Table one represents the demographics of the people who are projected to drop coverage as a result of removing the, indi the federal individual mandate penalty. Um, in other words, this is the maintenance population. If you want to maintain Vermont's current uninsured rate, you would want to maintain this population right here. And this table likely looks very familiar to you as board members because it came directly from Lewis and Ellis's individual mandate report that they published earlier this year. Um, it's important to note here that Lewis and Ellis's analysis is a projection and only takes financial determinants into consideration. So it did not take non-financial considerations such as um, uh, risk aversion or health status pending legislation like Act 182 that was passed or a person's sort of individual responsibility to, to be compliant with the law. So it's, it was purely a financial analysis. Um, table two down below represents the demographics of the uninsured population in 2014 when the federal individual mandate uh, was in effect. Um, the working group used the 2014 Household Health Insurance Survey for this data. There's a 2018 data that's due out very soon, although it has not been published. Um, the working group's understanding is that the 2018 results are expected to be roughly similar to the 2014 data, so they felt comfortable using the two, 2014 data. Um, the 2018 data will have a, a slightly lower uninsured rate overall and a statistically lower rate for those incomes below 139% of FPL, the Medicaid eligibility threshold. Any questions on this chart before I move on? Cap. This next slide 
shows uh, what we know about the impact in Vermont as a result of removing the um, federal penalty. As the board well knows, Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP each requested two, a 2% 2 increase in their 2019 indivi individual and small group rates directly attributable to the elimination of the federal penalty. The 2% requested increase would have increased overall premiums by approximately $9.8 million. The Green Mountain Care Board reduced it from 2% to 1.6%, thereby lowering the overall impact on premium to seven, approximately $7.8 million. Um, we know that that's what happened in 2019. It's unclear what will happen in the future. Uh, the chart on the right-hand side is a chart from um, Kaiser Health Report from March 2018. Kaiser conducted a survey and asked participants whether or not the individual mandate was still in effect for 2018. So the individual mandate penalty was removed beginning in January and these people were surveyed in March. A relatively small percentage of survey participants were correct. The correct answers are the people in the dark blue. Um, and what this demonstrates is that, as, that it, it's unclear. People still are, are not sure about the status of the individual mandate. And as individuals develop a clear understanding of the federal penalty status over time, enrollment and premiums may also be impacted over time. So that kind of concludes the background, what we know about Vermont, using the data sources that are available to us. And at this point, I'd like to ask Jason if he would go over the federal individual mandate. Are there any questions before I move on? Okay. So. Great, thank you. Thank you, Agatha, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Again, I am Jason Levitas, and sorry, what's forward that? Um, and I am uh, here today uh, thanks to the generous support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which supports a program called State Health and Value Strategies, which provides technical assistance to states uh, around the country to implement uh, the Affordable Care Act and other health care issues, a lot of helping states navigate the uh, federal landscape. Um, as part of that, I've worked with several states on passing and implementing individual mandates, including uh, New Jersey and, and Washington, D.C., which, as you know, are, are the two states that have implemented them to date. Uh, and as Agatha said, uh, I've been uh, providing technical support to the working group, uh, which, which I, I think has been uh, proceeding with great professionalism and skill, and it's been a pleasure to work with them. Um, my charge today is to, to talk a little bit about uh, the federal individual mandate, um, just sort of nuts and bolts of how it works, uh, because it, it's a possible model for uh, something that might happen here. And also, I'll, I'll say a little bit about what New Jersey and D.C. Uh, did in implementing their mandates and, and the modifications they made to the federal mandate. So with that, let's blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, so, right, review the rules and workings of the federal mandate, highlight modifications made by Jersey and D.C. Okay, background. So I think Agatha mostly went through this. Um, federal mandate took effect in 2014, along with the ACA's other major coverage provisions. Uh, it, it, the uh, penalty is repealed, effective at the end of this year. Uh, New Jersey and D.C. passed individual mandates this year, closely, closely based on the federal one that will take effect at the beginning of next year. And Massachusetts, as you know, enacted an individual mandate in 2007 as part of its big health reform law. So let's talk about the federal mandate and just how it works. So the basic structure uh, of the federal mandate is a requirement for individuals to maintain qualifying health coverage, qualify for an exemption, or else pay a penalty. So the key parameters of uh, that structure are the definition of qualifying coverage the uh, exemptions that are available and the penalty calculation. And I'll, I'll walk a bit through uh, uh, what the federal mandate does in each of those areas. There's also sort of the question of how it's administered. It's primarily through the federal income tax system. Um, certain exemptions are granted by the federal marketplace. Um, 
then the, the federal provisions also include an associated uh, coverage reporting requirement. Health insurers and other providers of qualifying coverage have to send uh, a, an information report to the IRS with a, with a uh, copy to covered individuals, sort of like uh, 1099s that you're familiar with from other contexts. Uh, and then the federal mandate also includes outreach to the uninsured using the information that's collected from the federal mandate about who is uninsured to reach out to those folks and try to get them covered. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about the, the Massachusetts mandate. It includes these same uh, major elements, sort of 30,000 foot level. It's very similar. It's different in a lot of particulars. Um, the states that have been looking at a mandate have mostly been doing something based more on the federal mandate. I think in large part just because it's easier, people are more familiar with it, there's continuity there. Um, but there are some elements of the Massachusetts mandate that a state uh, you know, may want to consider adopting. And we can talk about that if you would like. So on to qualifying coverage. Okay, so the, the ACA refers to it as a minimum essential coverage or MEC, and some people say MEC, although that, that uh, doesn't sound as nice to me, but we'll, we'll say MEC. Um, and it, it's, it's pretty simple. It generally includes all conventional public and private health coverage, employer coverage, whether it's through insurance or self-insured, individual market insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, VA, TRICARE, other federal programs. It excludes limited coverage like short-term plans, uh, dental and vision only plans, fixed indemnity plans. Um, and then CMS has the authority to designate additional coverage as MEC. And this is important because the list that Congress put in the bill leaves out some things like self-insured student health plans, which everyone thinks is good comprehensive coverage. So uh, CMS has the authority to uh, say that also counts. Exemptions. So there are a wide range of exemptions, and I, I think the key thing to know is there are exemptions that are written into the statute, and then there is also, again, the authority for CMS to designate additional exemptions, and they have exercised that authority in, in a variety of areas. So there are exemptions for low-income individuals, uh, folks with uh, income below the tax filing threshold, partly to shield them from paying a penalty, and partly so as not to create a new tax filing requirement for people who otherwise don't have to file. Uh, for unaffordable coverage, um, where co the cost of the enrollee to, to enroll is more than 8% and it's indexed, it's now 8.3% of income. Uh, for short coverage gaps of less than three months. Members of Indian tribes, of healthcare sharing ministries, which is a, a, a sort of uh, healthcare product, um, which is not subject to insurance regulation, but uh, has become more popular in some places. Uh, if, you, if you're enrolled in one of those, then uh, you're exempt. And certain religious groups, and so there's this religious conscious exemption, and it's, it's fairly narrow. In order to uh, qualify for that exemption, um, it's only for certain religious groups that have long-standing exemptions from Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes. It's basically groups that, as a policy, do not accept any kind of social insurance. So if you're in that group and you're already exempt from Social Security and Medicare uh, payroll taxes, then you also can get an exemption from the federal mandate. Individuals living abroad are exempt, certain non-citizens, including undocumented immigrants and non-resident aliens, and then a range of other hardships. There's a whole list that CMS has published, loss of a job, foreclosure, death of a family member, and individuals can also submit an application to say, hey, I, I had a bad year in these other ways, these things happened to me, and then CMS can consider those and uh, grant an exemption there as well. So most of these exemptions are just claimed on the tax return at the end of the year. But a few of them under the statute and partly by uh, administrative rule can be granted by the marketplace through a separate process that's av available year round. And the idea is that for some of the exemptions, you want to know during open enrollment before you make a decision about whether or not to enroll about whether or not you're going to be treated as exempt. So for example, the affordability exemption, you can claim it on the back end on the tax return. You can, always you can also claim it beforehand and say, it looks like my income is going to be such that coverage is going to be unaffordable. Give me an exemption now, and then that is fixed for the year. And then again, CMS has broad authority to designate additional exemptions, which they've done uh, in, in a bunch of different cases. 
on the penalty calculation. Um, so this is sort of at a high level. I think I included in uh, at the end a, 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 a more detailed slide that runs through exactly how the calculation works. Of course, it's uh, invisible to most taxpayers. It's you know it's calculated uh, by tax software or or your tax preparer. Um, but you know at, from at a high level, it's zero at low incomes. Uh, as we discussed, anyone below the filing threshold, and indeed. Because of the affordability exemption, most everyone who's ex who's eligible for Medicaid, which uh, you know is, is at least up to 130 percent of the federal poverty line in in states that expanded Medicaid, all of those folks uh, are generally uh, pay zero penalty. Then beyond that, it increases both with income and with the number of uninsured members of the family, and then it's capped. No one pays more than the cost of coverage. And it's also prorated for part of your coverage. So if you have coverage for six months out of the year, you'll pay half the penalty, et cetera. And uh, again, the appendix has additional details, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, administration, so the penalty is collected through the individual income tax system. There's a single line on the 1040, um, which I, I point out on the next slide if you just want to see what it looks like. Um, where you can check a box for full year, co full year coverage. Uh, there's also a space to report the penalty amount. There's also a separate form, Form 8965, uh, where you uh, claim or report an exemption. So if you're claiming an exemption for the first time there, then there's a code you put in. Or if you were granted an exemption by the marketplace, you uh, get a code from the marketplace, which you put, again, on that form. Um, so this next slide, again, the yellow arrow shows line 61, which is, you know, uh, the, the line on the 1040. Uh, and I, I always get this question, so I'll say, is that line going to stay in place with the federal mandate penalty repealed? The answer, no one knows because, uh, you know, the IRS has not released uh, any draft forms for 2019. Um, if I had to guess, based on my knowledge of the IRS from working um, with them for many years, the real estate on the 1040 is extremely valuable and they are going to want to get rid of that line uh, because it's not going to be connected to any, any payment anymore. So if, uh, I think it's, there's a good chance that that line will be gone from the federal uh, 1040 in a couple of years. Okay, outreach to uninsured. So as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, having an individual mandate provides pretty detailed information about who is uninsured. Everyone has to report it on their tax return. So the ACA leverages this, leverages this information uh, by providing for the IRS to notify the uninsured of coverage options each year. Now, bless you, the, the IRS has in fact uh, generally used alternative means for this outreach. I think in, in large part because of the cost, uh, they, they don't want to pay to send letters to everyone who's uninsured each year. Uh, as, as you may know, the IRS has, has suffered a lot of budget cuts. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think from, from my standpoint, uh, you know, there's a lot of value in doing it. And the one year that the IRS uh, did do that, they, they did see results. And indeed, uh, Massachusetts has made robust use of this information for outreach over the years. And uh, if you talk to the Massachusetts folks, they'll credit this information and the outreach they've been able to do as a major reason for the success of their health reform and, and having the lowest uninsured rate in the country. Um, finally, changes that DC and New Jersey uh, made in passing their individual mandate. So what DC and New, Jer New, New Jersey did, um, so there is a common method of passing tax laws called uh, at the state level called conformity with the federal with the federal code so for example i think 27 states for their state income taxes they define adjusted gross income by reference to federal agi and then they can make you know certain state level additions and subtractions but they start with that so New Jersey and DC basically did that for the individual mandate where they said we're going to incorporate the federal individual mandate rules before it was repealed into their state codes and then they made certain changes on top of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the changes that they made and you know most of them aren't big policy changes most of them you'll see are just sort of adjustments that are necessary for state context. 
So one is uh, they added an exemption for the state filing threshold. As I discussed before, you don't necessarily want to make people who don't otherwise have to file a tax return file it just for the individual mandate purposes. So DC and New Jersey both added an exemption based on their state filing threshold. They added exemptions for out-of-state residents, which is something that uh, Massachusetts has as well. Washington, D.C. only added an exemption for individuals whose income made them Medicaid eligible. So as I mentioned before, uh, individuals who are Medicaid eligible are generally exempt from the federal mandate penalty due to the affordability exemption, but it's a complicated set of rules to get there and it's not very intuitive and that's why you ended up with all of those accidental payments by folks who were exempt. And so I think that, you know, uh, D.C. thought that, you know, they, if they added an, an exemption that more explicitly applied to those folks, they would avoid the erroneous payments and the confusion. New Jersey didn't do that, but again, New Jersey incorporated the authority that's in the federal mandate to create additional exemptions, so they now can go ahead and say, you know, we too are going to have an exemption for everyone who's Medicaid eligible or really whatever income level they choose. Um, the penalty cap, so the federal penalty, as I mentioned, is, is capped at the cost of coverage. The way it works there, it's the national average bronze plan premium uh, is, is the cap. DC and New Jersey both shifted that to use the state average bronze plan premium, which is, you know, it doesn't uh, have a lot of impact, but it's important because the federal government is probably going to stop calculating the federal uh, average, the national average penalty. Um, they both include provisions, which Massachusetts also has, to ensure that there's no double, no double payment if the federal penalty is ever reinstated. It's not very likely that the federal penalty is uh, going to be reinstated, but who knows, and there's no harm in something that says, if you do have to pay a federal penalty, then your state penalty is reduced by that amount, which is what Massachusetts had done earlier. Um, they both have a reporting. Re they both have the reporting requirement, but modified uh, both for simplicity and for state authority. Um, the simplification is that uh, basically they say that reporting entities um, can use their federal reporting at the state level as well. And if since uh, coverage, since the. Uh, insurers and other coverage providers are already and will continue to be doing that reporting at the federal level, including sending it to the individual. Uh, New Jersey and DC are saying you don't have to send a second statement to the individual, which is, uh, uh, you know, se seems to make sense. And then other, you know, simple adjustments like changing the name from CMS to whatever agency uh, exists in the state, other things like that. Um, so. That is everything I wanted to talk about. Talk about. Again, uh, in the appendix, you'll find more details about the penalty calculation if you're interested. And beyond that, I'll just say thank you for having me, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Well, thank you, Jason. It's uh, a great pleasure to have you, and uh, I hope the uh, plane ride up was good, and I hope that the impending weather forecast <laughs> doesn't make your stay much longer than you had hoped. Um, my first question is, in your research, did you do any analysis on um, pre-ACA um, mandate and after ACA mandate on free and uncompensated care and what percentage of the overall health care spending that was and um, what the effects might have been on the cost shift? Sure. So I have not done research like that myself, and I should note I am a lawyer, not an economist. Um, so I, my my work tends to focus more on the legal and regulatory and the policy aspects. But I don't I don't uh, normally engage in economic research. But I am aware of research like that, which folks at the Urban Institute have uh, done a bunch of research in that area, and they certainly found a significant effect um, on uncompensated care. Um, and and they, I think they also found that to the extent that states had programs that subsidize uncompensated care when it happens, then the states could also potentially reap savings from reducing the uncompensated care that was happening in the state. And I'm, I'm happy to share that research with you, but again, it's not original to me. Has there been any analysis in Massachusetts on whether um, there are other factors that have led them to lead the nation in uninsured? other than the individual mandate? So there certainly has been, and, and indeed there's been research both in Massachusetts and also at the federal level about the impact of the individual mandate. 
The challenge in doing it, as, as, as it sounds like uh, you're aware, is that the individual mandate came into effect at the same time as other changes, and so how do you tease out the impact? The best research that I'm aware of, uh, especially about the federal mandate, uh, was done by, uh, so I'm also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a colleague of mine there, uh, Matthew Fiedler, he did some research where he looked specifically at people with incomes above 400% of the federal poverty line, so they were not eligible for the premium tax credit or cost sharing reductions um, under the Affordable Care Act. So if you look at, if you look at them between 2013, before the main coverage provisions of the ACA were in effect, and 2014, 2015, 2016, when all of that sort of came online, you can get sort of a relatively less obstructed view of uh, what the mandate did in isolation. And when he does that, he found a significant impact both on coverage and on premiums. His coverage, the, the coverage effect he found, turned out to be fairly similar to what you know, major analyses like the Congressional Budget Office have found, which is an, an, a nationwide impact on coverage of something in the seven to nine million range and an impact on premiums on the order of 10%. Can I ask a follow-up question to sure. that? How do you disentangle the mandate effect from the penalty effect in that kind of an analysis? So that's a great question. And I am, I am not aware of much of any research that has looked at the effect of having a mandate without a penalty. So I, I can't really speak to that. You could imagine that there would be some influence, uh, from, some influence from it. Um, yeah, and, and certainly, right, so you could look at individuals who have incomes low enough that they're exempt from the, from the penalty, but are just sort of aware of the, of the mandate and, you know, what effect it, did it have on them. Um, I'm not, there, there may be research like that, and I, I, I'm not aware of it. I'm probably the, the last one that should uh, be saying this, but in my mind, it's similar to driving down the interstate, that if you have the law that says you will go 65, you may or may not go there. If you're like me, you'll probably do a calculation of what is safe if there was no ticket involved, and you probably would drive 80. But that would be me. Um, other questions from the board? <laughs> Glad I'm not riding with you for to Castleton tomorrow. <laughs> Save you some time. <laughs> um, I, I just have a question about this: um, the, the exemption at 80 percent of income, and at 8 percent of income. And is there, a, in your mind, a solid rationale for that number, or is that a number that was came out of the scrum of Washington, and you know that's where that's where they ended up? That's a great question, um, and I, I, should, I should note, just to broaden it, I often get that question about the amount of the penalty as well, like what evidence is there that this is the right amount of the penalty? Because you know, the contours of the federal penalty and, and the federal affordability exemption are sort of similar to the Massachusetts one in that you know, they're sort of lines that go up, but they have different specifics, and you know, what's the evidence for which of them is, is the right answer? And I, and I must confess, that I don't know of any evidence like that. The, you know, the, there is evidence, again, that the mandate is effective. Um, and I think you know, general reasoning leads one to believe that a larger penalty is going to have a stronger impact on behavior than a smaller one. Um, but you know, is the mandate penalty in the right place? You know, we really don't know that. And again, you know, to, to your specific question about the exemption, um, you know, I, I think that there was research done into, well, what fraction of income do many people pay for coverage today, say, for employer-sponsored coverage? Um, and 8% was determined to be reasonable. And the way that it's indexed is it, it is indexed by looking at how the average share of income that people spend on coverage over the year is changing. So it is sort of tracked to something reasonable, but was 8% the exact right place to start you know, again, I, I think I think it's it's more that it was there was negotiation and it, it turned out to seem reasonable. 
one kind of quick question. Um, so I understand the research involved in the effectiveness of the individual mandate. And I'm wondering from, since from a legal perspective and a regulatory perspective, what are the conversations out there like around the carrot versus the stick approach in enforcing or encouraging uh, compliance with the individual mandate? Sure. Um, so in terms of the individual mandate itself, um, it is, it is largely, I mean, it's, in terms of the discussion out there, it, it largely is associated with sticks of various kinds. There are other options that are more like carrots. Those are generally different things. I mean, Ver Vermont already has uh, the subsidy, or, or two subsidies, both for premiums and cost sharing, which you, you know, we, we refer to it as a wrap because it wraps around the federal subsidies. And so that's a great way to get more people covered um, through a carrot. Um, there are other ways. States have worked on reinsurance programs which reduce premiums. Um, certainly doing outreach and education can have an effect as well. Um, but as for an individual mandate itself, so there is, there is some work, especially in Maryland and a little bit in Connecticut, although I think less developed in Connecticut, to try to combine an individual mandate with something that then takes the payment that that individual made and applies it towards their future premiums. So, and, the, and therefore to refer to it more as of, of a down payment, right? So yes, you weren't covered, so you have to pay this amount now, but this is not a penalty that you lose. This is a down payment towards you purchasing coverage in the future. So I mean, a couple things on that. One, just from a policy standpoint, on the one, you know, it, it certainly has an attraction in terms of, you know, seeming less punitive in some way. From the standpoint of the incentives it creates, I think it's helpful in that people then get discounted coverage so they're more likely to enroll once they pay the penalty. On the other hand, the upfront incentive, the stick to get coverage in the first instance is weaker because you, don't, you think you might not lose that money. So maybe you say, oh, well, I won't enroll this year because I'll owe a penalty, but I can get that money back and apply it towards my future coverage. So I think, you know, and, and as for, you know, how, how that, how those balance in terms of does that create more coverage or less than a sort of plain vanilla individual mandate, I'm not sure. And then I think there's also, there are also sort of administrative challenges involved with approaches like that, just sort of questions that need to be worked out, which I think could potentially be worked out, but would be uh, potentially a fairly heavy lift and require a lot of Co uh, coordination between your tax department and your marketplace in a way that would you know, just take a lot of programming and, and figuring out questions. Okay. Thank you. So can I, I know this is... Can I just, can I just say something? That, because, uh, the work group actually had a significant level of discussion trying to come up with incentives and incentive approaches to combine. Um, and, uh, and, you'll, and those will be detailed in in some of the slides that will come out on Friday. But we, I think one of the challenges to an incentive for coverage is that we ran into was that our concern was that in order to apply it in a fair way, it would end up being fairly expensive. So you, you have to either look at applying it to like, how do you parse that? Do you only give it to people who were uninsured for a period of time? Do you target it to a specific group? So we started to go down that route in terms of, um, like, a tax credit idea or an enhanced uh, premium assistance idea. But there was, I think, we felt a little challenged by the fact that that was going to be an expensive alternative that didn't seem particularly um, likely to be uh, moved forward in, in the current budget climate. So we did, you, you'll see some more when the slides come out on Friday, hopefully, that uh, give some context to that. But we, we spent uh, at least three work group meetings or working group meetings trying to come up with creative ways to, to do that. Can I just just follow up on what Jess was saying? So I, I know this says here on our agenda, it's the work group proposal, and here it says the overview of recommendations, but it is just about the penalty. Um, so not having the slides. Well, we'll we haven't actually got into the work group piece yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
That's, that's next on the agenda is to go over the working group's preliminary recommendations. So before we get there, I have uh, one more question. Um, Jason, uh, the states have pretty much gone through the filing periods for the QHP filings for next year. We know what the impact in Vermont is going to be, 1.6 percent, and we know that it would be a less than helpful comparison um, to look at other states because Vermont had different things going for it that other states didn't have. But I'm just curious if anybody's compiled the information and what the uh, variance is for um, the rate increases in other states uh, because of the lack of the uh, mandate, the penalty. So there has been some writing on this, which again, I'm happy to, and I, sh I should be keeping a list of uh, things to send you. Um, there has been some research on this. The one that sticks in my mind, because uh, it went the other way, is New Jersey announced that as a result of uh, having the individual mandate in place this year, that the proposed uh, premiums for uh, 2019 came in, was it 8% or 6%? I think it was 8% lower than it would have had they not instituted their mandate to take effect in 2019. But there's been a range of estimates. The, the picture has been complicated this year um, for a number of reasons. One is that a lot of analysis showed that premiums for 2018 were probably too high, and if, if there had not been changes like the, the federal mandate going away, then in many places, rates would have actually declined, and actually they, they did end up declining in New Jersey. Um, so that's one piece of it. I think the other piece of it, um, and uh, if there are any issuers in the room, they'll have to forgive me for saying this, is that uh, the level of uncertainty about the federal environment has been great enough for several years, including about the enforcement of the federal mandate, even when it was technically still on the books. You may recall that in early 2017, there were these stories about the silent returns, the IRS not rejecting silent returns, and whether the IRS was just, in fact, not going to be enforcing uh, the mandate. Um, that, and, and as the slide, uh, as the slide that uh, Agatha showed, uh, in terms of public opinion, a lot of people thought the mandate was already gone. Anyway, for, for all of those reasons, our understanding is that issuers may have already, even before 2019, been inching up their premiums because of uncertainty or you know federal factors or you know sort of saying like, well, we don't know about this mandate, we're going to increase it now a bit. So premiums. Long story short, we think that 2018 premiums already to some extent reflected a less effective or partially repealed mandate. And so now when you go to a fully repealed mandate, it's not clear that the, the jump to 2019 is going to be as big. Of course, there isn't a fully repealed mandate. There's a fully repealed penalty. And we all make that mistake. That's, I think that's right. Um, yeah, you know, it would be interesting. The, 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 the Kaiser polling has not focused on that question. Um, it's, it's complicated in part. Like, you, you, you are absolutely right that if you read the bill, it zeroes out the penalty and does not repeal the mandate. On the other hand, if you look at how, say, President Trump and other politicians talk about it all the time, they talk about it in terms of the, the mandate is gone. So it would be interesting to know what public opinion is, because of course when issuers set their rates, what they care about is do people think there's a mandate out there. It would be interesting to know, do people think, do people know, do people understand that distinction that the penalty is gone but the mandate is still in place? And I'm not sure about that. So Agatha, do you want us to open it up to public questions at this point or wait till? Well, I think maybe go through the recommendations. The reason Jason went f first is because so many of the working group's recommendations are very similar to what he just discussed. So I think it would make sense to package those together. Okay. That's, that's okay? Yep. Okay. Jason, do you mind if I use that clicker? I'm going to reuse some of your slides. All right. So we're going to reuse a couple of Jason's slides. Um, so now I'll go through the working group's preliminary recommendations. But before I do that, <clears throat> it's important to note that the working group was unable to come to consensus on an enforcement mechanism as well as two of the ex exemptions. 
The working group's report attempts to provide a fair and balanced presentation of alternative, alternative approaches, and I will highlight the areas of non-consensus when we get to them. Um, but now I'll go into the recommendations on minimum essential coverage, what is qualifying coverage. And since Jason just went over this, I'll use his slide. Um, the working group recommends adopting the federal definition of minimum essential coverage, MEC, as some people call it, including all the forms of coverage Jason just went over on this slide. However, in adopting the federal definition for application in Vermont, there are a couple technical um, corrections or modifications that the working group would recommend. Um, two of them specifically. One is that um, currently federal MEC has both a definition and associated guidance. And Act 182 adopted the federal definition as of December 31st of 2017, but not the associated guidance. And so the working group would recommend that the associated guidance also be adopted as of December 31st, 2017. So it's, it's a, a technical um, recommendation. The second recommendation is the working group recommends that the Department of Financial Regulation be provided authority to consider and deem new forms of coverage or health insurance products as MEC using the criteria established in federal law and guidance, very similar to what DC and New Jersey did is taking it from the CMS level to the state level. And so those are the two modifications that the working group would recommend as it relates to minimum essential coverage. Um, the benefits of doing this is that it provides consistency to policyholders. So if someone had MEC compliant coverage last year, they'll have it this year as well, assuming they have the same plan. It maintains high standards for health insurance coverage in Vermont and it ensures that individuals will not be subject to different state and federal level, state and federal definitions of minimum essential coverage. And that in a nutshell are the recommendations on MEC. Are there any questions? Questions from the board? Robin, anything to add before I open it up to the public? Currently not. Satellite play. <laughs> so, um, any public comment or questions? I hope so. Well, that's a quiet group. <laughs> well, minimum essential coverage might be the least tantalizing portion of the recommendations. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Exemptions. Um, and after exemptions is enforcement, and that would will wrap up the recommendations. So, um, the working group recommends, I'm going to use Jason's slide. The working group recommends adopting the federal list of exemptions, which are up here on the slide. Um, but in adopting this federal definition, the, rec the working group recommends also adopting that associated federal guidance as of December 31st, 2017, and making some modifications for application in Vermont. So I'll go through these, and they're actually very similar. A lot of them are very similar to what Jason went over um, for New Jersey and DC. So the first bullet, low income, um, below a, a tax filing threshold, the working group recommends just syncing this up with the Vermont filing threshold, bringing it to the state level. The second bullet, unaffordable coverage, this is essentially an affordability exemption. It's so closely related to the penalty. Um, whenever people talk about the penalty, they, they talk about an affordability exemption and vice versa. So I'll actually discuss the affordability um, exemption when we get to the penalty slide. Uh, the next bullet point, short coverage gaps. The federal definition is, is two months or less, and so the, the working group recommends bringing it to three months or less. This brings it in line with Vermont's definition of short-term limited duration insurance. Um, the next bullet point, this has to do with categories of um, memberships in certain groups, and a majority of the working group recommends maintaining the ACA interpretation of this exemption. Uh, the working group was approached by healthcare sharing ministries and Christian science, scientists specifically. Under the federal definition, healthcare sharing ministries are exempt. Christian <coughs> scientists are not. Um, each of these groups requested to be exempt from the individual mandate. 
uh, the working group discussed these requests and decided to stick with the federal definition, continued to exempt healthcare sharing ministries, but not the Christian um, scientists. But this is one of those areas where there was not full consensus. Um, Blue Cross Blue, F Blue Shield does not agree with exempting healthcare sharing ministries and recommends that they also be um, subject to the, to the mandate. Let's see, individuals living abroad, um, again, something that New Jersey and D.C. did that when it's a national mandate, state borders don't matter, but when it's a state-based mandate, state borders do matter, and so this would exempt non-Vermont residents that make um, income in Vermont. So if, you, if someone lives in New Hampshire, but they earn income in Vermont, they would be exempt from the Vermont, the Vermont mandate. Um, and then... The last bullet point are their hardships. The working group does recommend um, including a hardship exemption. They recommend that Vermont issue a um, state-specific guidance, including a list of events that are presumed to cause a hardship. This would make it easier to administer and easier for the public to understand. And then lastly, the second to last bullet is about how the um, exemptions are administered. The working group recommends that all exemptions be claimed at the point of enforcement and not prospectively. Jason mentioned that um, under the federal individual mandate, someone could apply for the exemption partway through the year. This would be um, a, a retrospective, the working group recommends a retrospective administration. So someone would request the exemption at the time that they, they need it and not at the time that they think they might possibly need it. Again, this is reducing administrative burden. Lastly, uh, the working group recommends honoring all federal exemptions issued to individuals based on the criteria above. So if someone is granted an exemption certificate on the federal level, it would be honored in Vermont. That concludes the recommendations on the exemptions. We still have enforcement mechanism to go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The final set of recommendations addresses the enforcement mechanism. And at this time, I just want to read quickly the language from Act 182, which describes legislative intent on this topic. It is the intent of the General Assembly that the individual mandate to maintain minimum essential coverage established by, established by this act should be enforced by means of a financial penalty or other enforcement mechanism and that the enforcement mechanism or mechanisms should be enacted during the 2019 legislative session in order to provide notice of the penalty to all Vermont residents prior to the open enrollment period for coverage for the 2020 plan year. So that just kind of sets the stage for what the, the legislative charge that the working group was trying to fulfill. As noted earlier, the working group was unable to come to consensus, consensus on an enforcement mechanism, but in line with the working group's guiding principles that I mentioned earlier, um, to present alternatives when consensus is not met, the working group's draft report includes different enforcement mechanism alternatives. So. The, um, I'll first describe where there was consensus. The group ag agrees that a key mechanism for maintaining coverage relates to continued and improved outreach and monitoring of the uninsured population. So specif specifically as it relates to improved outreach and monitoring, the Agency of Human Services will continue out outreach efforts that will emphasize the responsibility Vermonters have to maintain health coverage. The agency will also continue to educate consumers about the results of silver, lo silver loading, including the increase in premium subsidies for 2019, the relative value of non-silver plans, and the options for unsubsidized members to enroll in reflective silver plans. Um, in, in terms of enhancing monitoring, the Agency of Human Service will improve monitoring and timeliness of data on the uninsured to monitor any changes in Vermont's uninsured rate, both overall and by specific demographics. So that's an explanation of a mechanism by which we could maintain um, coverage through enhanced efforts of outreach and monitoring. Not all working group members believe that outro outreach and monitoring efforts are sufficient alone. Those members recommend a financial penalty through the state income tax system in addition to the outreach and monitoring efforts. Specifically, they recommend modifying the federal penalty for application in Vermont, and I will go through that quickly using Jason's slide here. So that first bullet point, zero at low incomes, 
um, the penalty approach would incorporate a flat exemption for families below a certain income. What income? The working group discussed a threshold level ranging between 200 and 400 percent FPL. Specifically, they discussed using the Dr. Dinosaur qualification level of 312 percent FPL, but did not reach consensus on a specific level. Um, the next bullet point, increases with income and number of uninsured. This, this is the affordability exemption um, that I was punting from the exemption section. Uh, the recommended penalty approach adopts the federal calculation. So as Jason went over, um, if the cost of coverage is more than 8.3% 8 8.3% now um, of household income um, for families above the threshold, they would be exempt from the mandate. The next bullet point, no one pays more than the cost of coverage. Um, Jason already went over this with D.C. and New Jersey, but the penalty would be capped at the lowest, the lowest cost state bronze plan. Um, previously, it was the lowest cost average national bonds, bronze plan, but um, it's our understanding that the um, national average calculation will be discontinued. So benchmarking it to the state plan makes sense. And then lastly, prorated, yes, the working group does recommend that um, the penalty also be prorated when it's a, if it's a state-based um, penalty. So you would only pay for it for the months that you did not have coverage. So that concludes the recommendations. Okay. Are there questions from the board? <laughs> Once again, Robin, I'll try to see if you have anything further to add. I don't. Can you hear me now? We can now. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. I must, I must have not quite managed to get myself off mute. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Um, at this point, we'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Okay. Oh. Mr. Healthcare Advocate. Mike Fisher here. I, I think um, there's a detail in the last point that Agatha made that's noble. And that is that the, um, the average uh, bronze plan was in the order of $275, um, something like that. Don't quote me exactly. It was in that range. Uh, whereas you may remember from uh, your decision you recently made, the lowest cost bronze plan here in Vermont is more in the order of uh, 445 or something like that. And so when you're talking about 8.3% of income spent on one, either of those, um, the proposal in front of you is significantly different and significantly more um, uh, recognition of affordability. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Yes, Walt. Uh, Walter Carpenter, Montpelier, um, Healthcare for All. Are we going to provide some subsidies for all this, or has that been determined yet? Um, part of what's the so that that's not part of the uh, mission of the the work group on this particular piece of legislation. Um, those are the type of questions that would be better asked to Representative Donahue when she's at the State House. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, could I just add, add something on that? Certainly. Uh, thank you. So I think I think it is worth noting that all the states that have enacted state individual mandates have dedicated that money towards some sort of affordability purposes. Massachusetts has long dedicated its mandate revenue for its state wrap, which is similar to Vermont's. And uh, New Jersey created a state reinsurance program, and uh, which is which is funded by the mandate revenue. And, and DC has a similar provision. It's, it says it needs to be used for outreach to the uninsured or other purposes that support coverage or affordability. So I, I mean, I, this may be beyond the. Uh, purview of, of the, the current work, but I think there is thinking to be done of if, we, if, if a mandate does collect revenue, what is done with that revenue and how can it be used to help support coverage and help people comply. Thank you. This is Robin. There will be, uh, I don't have the slides, the draft slides right in front of me, but I believe we did, in the working group, did 
add um, a, a notation in the slide that should the legislature enact a penalty that um, the recommendation would be to target that revenue towards uh, affordability or enrollment. Super. Any other questions or comments? Mike. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just add to that. Um, I think it's important. Uh, the Healthcare Advocates Office um, uh, appreciates all the members of the working group and Jason for helping us out. Um, it's been a um, point and effort. Um, uh, I do want to say out loud, in reference to Walter's last statement, um, we believe a better strategy for dealing with our uninsured population would be to increase uh, premium subsidies, the wrath, if you will. Um, if, uh, if the legislature, if, if we're unable to get that, um, we do recognize the role that a, um, a financial penalty has uh, for an individual in, uh, in keeping people in Great. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just add, I have a clarification on the public comment. You just have to uh, clarify where the public comments from the work group is going, and then separate that from our own mm -hmm. Green Mountain Care Board public comments. So the board, there's a yeah. specific work group. I think um, the HCA set up a specific comment um, website folks to send their, or email, thank you. Email. I'm fighting a cold, I'm yeah. thinking clearly. Um, a web, uh, email where folks can send their comments regarding this presentation and the work. And, and I also want to just comment, if we do get those comments to the board, I think we'll forward them to this because I think they're really on the working group subject, not on the board's work. So okay. we should, if we get them, we will forward them to them. Great. Okay, anything else? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. At this point, is there, well, before I go to old business, I just want to uh, make one more public service announcement that tomorrow uh, at Castleton University at 10 o'clock is the summit on workforce, probably the greatest issue facing healthcare in the state. And um, just a reminder, it'll be the last one. So uh, with that being said, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Judy, if you could call the roll. Robin. Yes. Jess. Yes. Tom. Yes. Chair. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the afternoon. <laughs>